Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Macy Phillips. I'm a data scientist at Data IQ, and today we're going to talk a little bit about GIF classification, image classification. We're going to dive into convolutional neural networks a lot, so you're ready. Okay, this is an agenda for today. We're going to talk about image classification more broadly. We're going to talk about convolutional neural networks, which is one of the main ways that people use machine learning to classify images these days. We're going to then talk about residual networks in this one particular model that I use to classify GIFs. And then we're going to go into a live demo where we'll kind of like drag and drop some GIFs and classify them. It would be fun, maybe. Uh, so a bit about me. I'm a data scientist at Data IQ. I have a bachelor's in math and economics from Wesleyan. I was a graduate of NYC Data Science Academy, so it's, it's always good to be back. I want to thank the folks here for hosting me again, taking me back in. And uh, just a little bit about Data IQ. We're an end-to-end -end software for data science solutions. We do a lot on companies' existing architecture. We incorporate different open source software capabilities. And uh, it's a software that's meant to be for everyone. So even if you don't know how to code, even if you don't have a PhD in statistics, you can use Data IQ. OK, image classification. There are a lot of different use cases across a number of different industries these days for image classification. Uh, Facebook uses image classification to find people's faces in profile pictures. Uh, the Department of Defense uses image classification on uh, satellite imagery data to try and find offshore missile sites. Uh, a lot of different healthcare startups use image classification to find tumors for CAT scans. And there are also some companies that read bank checks. So all y'all have messy handwriting. Someone needs to figure out what's an eight and what's a zero on the checks that you write. And image classification is how all these companies do these things. OK, so what is the problem that I'm going to talk to you about today? We have a lot of different GIFs out there on the web, and we want to tag them. We want to figure out what's in them, what's going on. What do we have by way of data? We have this one data set called the ImageNet database. This has 14 million static images, along with a bunch of tags associated with each image. These were hand tagged by humans at ImageNet. And this is widely considered one of the most popular image classification repositories out there on the web. Uh, there are some others, but I chose to use ImageNet for this particular problem. OK, and so training a classifier to classify GIFs is a little tough. First, we're going to start out with static images. This is a little more manageable. So how do we do it? Neural networks, deep learning. Uh, this graph right here, I believe, was presented at some conference back in 2016. It showed di different models' accuracy on the ImageNet data set. So how accurate were these models in predicting that this picture of a dog was, in fact, a dog, or this picture of a boat was, in fact, a boat? And you can see that the blue dots over here on the left are traditional image classification techniques, and then the green over here on the right are deep learning. So all of the more successful classification models post, was that, 2012 have been through using deep learning. Now, what is deep learning? I like this one definition on Wikipedia, which says that deep learning is a class of machine learning algorithms that uses multiple layers of nonlinear processing units for feature extraction and transformation. I think the nonlinear is key, and the multiple layers is key in this definition. So, uh, just to kind of visualize what deep learning looks like, here over on the left, we have a deep neural network. You can see we have multiple layers, and over here on the right, we have a shallow neural network, just one layer. Now you're probably wondering what's going on in this neural network. Like, what are these dots? What are these connectors? What does this all mean? Uh, so here's a simple shallow neural network. As an example, um, we have do, do, do these inputs on the left. So these could be features in your data set. These could be features about a person in their credit history. These could be pixels. The next step is you have the weights. So these are the connections between your neurons on the left and your neurons in the middle. Uh, these are the things that we're ultimately going to train in our image classification model. And what we do is we compute the dot products between these inputs and the weights. 
Uh, next, we send that dot product through what's called an activation function. This is a function that basically like wraps up that dot product in a nice, neat way where we can train it more effectively later on. And then uh, finally, after doing that, a couple steps, you have multiple layers, you keep, keep computing these dot products and feed them through activation functions, we end up with our output, which is going to be a class of dog or cat or house, boat, whatever. Okay, so like I just said, uh, our ultimate goal in image classification is finding a probability that a certain image has a dog in it or a cat in it. Uh, we don't want a boat in it. Uh, great, so next step, convolutional neural networks. These are the most popular technique nowadays for image classification. And you can see on the left we have our images, so pixels from an image. You feed it through your convolutional neural network, and then ultimately our output is cat, dog, or whatever. Uh, this is a more detailed look at what a convolutional neural network looks like. We have different types of layers along the way. So you can see, again, we have our input of pixels in the image. We have a convolutional layer, like right here. And notice that it's three-dimensional. We'll talk about that a little later. But this is a box. It's not just a line of neurons. Uh, next step, we've got a pooling layer. We have another convolutional layer, another pooling layer. And then ultimately, we're going to flatten out these three-dimensional neuron, neuron layers into our output, which is going to be, what is the probability that this image has a car, truck, van, a cat dog, whatever. Okay, so first step, we're going to talk about convolutional layers. What does that mean? And the goal of a convolutional layer is to detect certain features of an image. So if I have an image of a person, I want to figure out what makes the left side of an ear, or the right side of a nose, or the bottom part of, a, of an eye, or what's the nose more broadly, or an eye more broadly. Convolutional layers are great for that. So yeah, we're trying to find an ear. I or nose. Uh, so this is a fully connected neural network, right? You can see that all of the neurons on the left are connected to the ones in the middle, are connected to the ones on the right. So what's different about a convolutional layer is that we're, we're going to only connect the neurons that are right next to each other, right? So we only care about pixels that are grouped in certain areas. This is like a really high level diagram of what's going on in a convolutional neural network. Here's another way of representing it, except now we're in two dimensions because our images are two dimensional. Uh, so you can see that the convolutional layer is like this shaded square running across the image. So it runs across each pixel and tries to detect, hey, do I see a side of a nose here? Do I see a lip here? Do I see eyes here? This slide is important because it shows the depth of convolutional layers. Um, we have one filter right here, which might try to detect, like I said before, the side of a nose. But you want multiple filters throughout your layer to detect different features. So you have your low-level features, like different sides of your eyebrows or noses or whatever. And you also have high-level features, like eyes, nose, mouth. And you need a separate filter to detect each one of those features. So it's important to have a lot of depth in your feature maps in a convolutional layer. So uh, typically in a convolutional neural network, you'll have multiple convolutional layers. And the ones at the beginning are good for detecting low-level features. So like edges, points, stuff that's pretty abstract. Uh, as you move on in your network, convolutional layers further on are better, de better at detecting high-level features. So like this is a nose, this is a head, this is a person, or this is even a particular person. This is Patrick. Okay. Uh, the last part about convolutional layers that I should mention is the activation function. Uh, this activation function takes in that dot product, that input of your, uh, your input values, multiplied by your weights, and we won't go too far into that right now. But there are three main types nowadays, and those are the sigmoid function, the tanh function, and the Rayleigh function. 
they all have their advantages. A lot of people like ReLU nowadays because it's very computationally efficient. It's a lot easier to compute the ReLU function than the other ones. Okay, next step in our neural network, we're gonna talk about the pooling layer. So the pooling layer is designed to reduce the dimensionality of your data set. So you're just shrinking your data set from say 32 by 32 neurons to 16 by 16. And this is a really good way to uh, reduce the time complexity of training your models. So a lot of people use these. Okay, lastly, we're gonna talk about flat and fully connected layers in your neural network. Uh, yeah, so hopefully at this point, you've trained your model such that the convolutional layers have picked up on some very high level features. So this layer detects an arm, this de list layer detects a leg, this detects a face. Uh, now we want to fully connect all of those neurons to our outputs, which are going to be our different classes. So this is a human, this is a dog, this is a boat. And the final step is computing this probability. Okay, uh, I could probably, I mean, there are, there are entire talks devoted to back propagation, gradient descent, and grid search, which are the main three concepts behind training neural networks. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail today, but I think you should know that back propagation very broadly is the process of finding the error attributable to each neuron in your neural network. And then gradient descent is once you find out that error gradient, you start to descend along the error gradient so that you can eventually find a local minimum. And then uh, grid search is a good way to find the optimal number of neurons, the optimal number of layers. There are obviously a lot of options here, so grid search is hugely important to find that out. Okay, uh, back to my problem of GIF classification. The model I chose to use was ResNet 50, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit because I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so this particular model won first place in a well-known image classification competition in 2015. It was trained on that ImageNet data set that I talked about earlier, which has 14 million images. Uh, you can also get it directly from Keras, and you can import it directly into DataIQ if any companies here use DataIQ. Okay, this is what the architecture looks like of ResNet 50. Pretty complex, a lot of stuff going on here, but hopefully after that 15 minute intro, you guys can get a little bit of an understanding of what's going on here. So we see we start out with a convolutional layer, we then feed that into a pooling layer, followed by a bunch of more convolutional layers, a final pooling layer, and then a fully connected layer, which leads to our output. And uh, you'll notice that we have these weird humps going from each convolutional layer. They don't just go straight one connected to each other. So I want to dive into that a little bit. Um, so this is this is a zoomed in version of just that right there. Um, and what's going on here is we're taking the residual outputs from the layer two above the current layer and we're passing that back into the activation function. So that means that instead of passing just the output of this layer into our ReLU function, we're also taking the output from two layers prior. And a bunch of researchers who created this model felt that this was uh, particularly important in training deep neural nets. Oh yeah, so it's like, like Steph Curry like behind the back. Assist, yeah. Okay. Uh, so why did they choose this residual structure? Um, on the left, we have a non-residual structure. So this is just a typical feed-forward convolutional neural network where one layer passes into another. Right? So no feeding back, no Seth Curry assist going on on the left. And it's hard to notice, but uh, the red line is a deeper neural network, and the blue line is a shallower neural network. And you can see that the shallower neural network performed better across the training and test sets along this conventional convolutional neural network structure, which seems a little bit odd. Typically, when you add more layers to a deep neural net, it tends to overfit and you tend to get a really ridiculously low training error, but that wasn't the case for image classification. So these researchers decide to take this residual approach, incorporate that two layers back thing back in, and they found that this was really good. And so on the right, this is the residual structure, 
And again, the blue line is a shallower neural network, and the red one is a deeper neural network. And so this acts as, like we expect it would, the training and tester are both lower for the deeper neural net. So that's why this group did so well, that's why they won this competition in 2015, that's why I decided to choose this one model for my approach. So GIFs are a little tougher, moving images, how do we deal with this? The approach I took is, is pretty simple. Uh, what I did was just split the GIF into frames, so we have like 60 frames per GIF. This is super elementary. Uh, then we classify each frame using our neural network. And then finally, all we do is sum the probabilities of the predicted classes across all frames to come up with sort of an aggregate score, what's going on. And so I really like this simple approach, one, because it's simple to explain, and also because we get to use a lot of great pre-trained neural networks. I'm not an academic. A lot of people have created a lot of great structures that I want to leverage. Um, and also, you, through this approach, you can capture different points in your time series, right? So like, here we have like shack in one frame and a cat in another frame. This structure will, in theory, pick up both shack and cat. Some disadvantages to this approach, it takes longer to hand label each of the individual frames of a GIF. So I mentioned earlier that the ImageNet data set was hand labeled by people. Um, and this just becomes a lot harder for GIFs, right? Because if you have the first part of this GIF is just a praying mantis, we don't want to associate that snapshot with a keyboard. Um, and conversely, a shot of a keyboard, we don't want to associate with praying mantis. So we have to go in and individually classify each of these frames. So it's a novel idea, but there are definitely some disadvantages. So a quick demo on Red Hill. Okay, so if we just have this like brown bear, uh, this is all done in data IQ, by the way. Uh, so these are the top five tags associated with that bear gym. So we got like Teddy, Baboon was pretty spot off, Irish Water Spaniel off, Brown Mare is not too bad. Uh, and the way this, this thing works is we can just delete that. And let's see. Let's do one. Oh, let's see what. Okay, so we have our panda falling, and then when I press, press this run button, this automatically runs a scenario in Data Haiku, which scores this GIF based on our model. So for a bit of what's going on behind the scenes, this is a, a workflow in Data Haiku, so we bring in the GIF into one of these folders, we splice it up using a custom Python recipe, uh, and then we score it using that ImageNet 50 model. And then we do a little pre-preparation steps to get it into a nice format where we can label each of the classes and assign them a weight. Let's see how that well, what we were doing here was just splicing this GIF up into 60 frames, classifying each of those frames, and then coming up with a weighted score for each of the tags based on this image net model. Um, so we get giant panda, fountain. That's a little weird, American black bear, bison, brown bear. Uh, but again, we can take a look at the score and say, hey, this 13.5 looks pretty good. Uh, yeah. So, last slide is, uh, I think, a couple ideas for the future if anyone were to take this on. Um, one idea is you could use both convolutional and recurrent layers to try and track a GIF over time, try and track certain objects over time. Uh, and then the second one is to do feature extraction for NLP. We know that in a lot of GIFs nowadays, there are texts. That's it.